Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for Global VetLink Simplifying Regulation Nation Animal Disease Traceability and Interstate Movement Seminar. We're excited to have you with us. We know that there's a lot of information in store for you, so be aware that while today uh, you pick up CE credits for participating in this presentation, there are options to help you if you're unable to stay for the entire presentation or if you were unable to join us for today's portion of it. The requirements to earn the CE credits, you must watch the webinar on a computer to earn those. Audience only attendance does not meet CE credit and you must be present for at least 45 minutes of the 60 minute presentation. This webinar is accredited for one hour of race certified continuing education. If you're attending with a group, please make sure to complete the digital sign-in sheet found at the link on your website to assure that you receive the continuing education credit. And then approximately a week after the webinar is complete, attendees will receive an email with a CE credit certificate attached. If you're watching with a group, again, you must complete the digital sign-in sheet found at the link on your screen. Any questions, please contact Amy Arnell at Global Vet Link. Her number is there. A link to a recorded video of today's presentation will be sent to your registration email address and a link to the recorded video will also be available on the Global Vet Link website and YouTube channel. And if for some reason you're not able to attend it for the required amount of time but still wish to earn CE, you can watch the remaining portion of the recorded webinar and submit a post-test found at the Global Vet Link link that you see before you. Well, I've taken care of the details, the small print. We're again excited that you could join us for this very fast-paced hour, so we'll go ahead and move ahead today with us speaking our Vice President of Government and Industry Affairs at the Livestock Marketing Association, Chelsea Good. You can see from the curriculum in front of you on the screen that her prior experience at this communications director at the Kansas Department of Agriculture and a staff attorney specializing in animal health law and policy certainly prepare her to address today's topic. Following Chelsea will be Kaylin Henry, product manager and subject matter expert at the Global Vet Link. With that, I turn it over to Chelsea Good. We're excited that you're with us. Chelsea, it's all yours. Perfect. Well, appreciate you all having me here today. Um, just briefly want to talk a little bit about who LMA is, and then my role is really going to be explaining this animal disease traceability rule and what it requires. So a uh, Livestock Marketing Association, uh, we represent 77% of your regularly selling livestock auctions, livestock market sale barns across the U.S., uh, regularly scheduled uh, sales about once a week in order to meet that uh, definition. And we're really that junction between buyers and sellers. We sell livestock on commission and are a lot of times a physical location or sometimes a online auction where those buyers and sellers get together. And in doing that, we are often uh, one of the places that livestock are identified prior to moving interstate. So we've been engaged in this animal disease traceability rule and the implementation of the rule. This is just a screenshot showing you uh, where our 800 members are located, spread out across the United States, as you can see. Thinking about animal disease traceability and uh, why we're here, I think it's good to remember, um, this is a USDA fact sheet, that we're not here talking about the prevention of disease. Rather, um, we're talking about the ability to efficiently and accurately trace animals where they've been, what animals they've been around once disease is located. And if you uh, have been involved in the livestock industry for any period of time, you're going to know why this cow over here is wearing a Santa Claus hat. And that would be the cow that stole Christmas, December 23rd, 2003. And obviously, as an industry, we're working on livestock identification prior to that point. Um, but I think that this graph here is really illustrative of just how important this is for our industry. This is a graph showing uh, exports of U.S. beef, and you can see how they dropped drastically after 2003. And really, it took us about a decade in order to uh, build our exports back up to where we were prior to that point. So uh, given that background, um, I think it seems logical that we are where we are today. But it's also important to remember that this is a complex situation. Uh, this is a map of the U.S. that shows cattle movement uh, based on 
a percentage of ICVI's health certificates and really to me demonstrates that we've got livestock moving a lot of different places all over in the United States today. We also have um, a pretty independent mindset in the agriculture industry. Uh, it says Sam Elliott, and I think he embodies in some people's mind that kind of um, rugged, independent mindset that we have in a lot of our producers, market owners, veterinarians even. So um, as we address this uh, identification, you know, those are some of the challenges that we're all working through together. So in terms of what is ADT, um, Many of you will remember National Animal Identification System, NAIS. Um, that system was um, something USDA ended up um, saying that they were not moving forward with, went back to the drawing board, and ADT is what we came up with. Um, the proposed rule was published in August of 2011. Typically, you'll have a comment period of 60 days for a proposed rule. There was lots of discussion and thoughts about this proposed rule, so that period was actually extended to December 9th of 2011. Uh, USDA received a little over 1,600 comments and ended up publishing a final rule about a year later, December 20th, 2012. And that final rule that we're talking about and implementing today went into effect on March 11th of 2013. So what is required for ADT? I'm going to really focus on uh, the cattle component. Uh, for cattle, the following animals must be identified with an official ID if they're traveling interstate. Um, sexually intact cattle, 18 months of age or older is the biggest category, but the ADT rule also does require the identification of all female dairy cattle of any age and also dairy me males um, intact or castrated, so dairy steers, that are born after that effective date of March 11th, 2013. Finally, the ADT rule also requires that cattle that are used for rodeos, shows, exhibition, recreational events be identified regardless of age. It's important to remember that this rule only applies to cattle that are moving from one state to another. It does not apply to cattle that are staying in state. In addition to the identification requirement, the federal ADT rule also has a uh, documentation and health certificate component of what is required. Um, cattle requiring official identification must also have an inst interstate certificate of veterinarian inspection, ICVI, or what we commonly call health certificate, or alternative documentation um, in order to cross state lines. Also, generally, the official identification number of cattle that are officially ID'd must also be recorded on this health certificate. Only exception there is if they're moving directly to slaughter or if you have dairy steers under 18 months of age. I think it's important to remember that there was quite a few changes between uh, what USDA initially proposed and what those final requirements came out and that we just went over. Uh, these first three bullets are changes that allow for some flexibility, allow state veterinarians to make some decisions within the rule. We'll talk about those a little bit more in depth. Uh, the fourth one I really do want to point out though, and that is that beef cattle under 18 months of age are exempted. Um, so your feeder cattle, are not a part of this initial rule. Initially, USDA um, had discussed um, allowing a phase two of feeder cattle to happen at a later date under this same rulemaking process, and um, industry pushed back there, and USDA um, has now said they intend to address feeder cattle at a later time under a separate rulemaking process. So those state veterinarian decisions, you know, what are the flexibilities that we mentioned? Um, one of the big ones is what counts as official identification. The federal rule does uh, list out um, official identification ear tags, your 840 tags for cattle born in the United States as um, identification that will count no matter what state you're in. However, state veterinarians also have the ability to accept um, some alternative identification brands, tattoos, breed registration as official ID. However, it's important to remember that both the shipping and receiving states or tribes, if you're moving to a tribe, must accept that 
alternative form of official identification in order for it to count under the rule. Another important state veterinarian decision, and one that's getting a lot of discussion regionally right now, is the ability for states to ad agree to and accept a document besides a health certificate. Um, state vets can agree to accept an alternative movement document um, other than an ICVI when both the shipping and receiving states agree to that. Um, that's important to remember because that ICV, that alternative document might not be a health document like an ICVI is, but it could be an alternative document that is used as a movement document to fulfill the ADT rule if both the shipping and receiving states agree that that's acceptable in their perspective. There's also um, a couple of exceptions that are built into this ADT rule to make it a little bit more workable, a little bit more flexible. One of the big ones is having a back tag option for cattle that are going directly to slaughter. If cattle are moved directly to uh, slaughter, they can move on an approved back tag instead of an official identification, even if they're moving between states. In addition, uh, cattle can move from out of state in state to an approved tagging site and then directly to slaughter on that back tag as long as there's only one approved tagging site that is the stopping point in that transaction. The second flexibility that we're going to talk about today is the owner shipper statement exception. And this is an exception that was created for cattle that are moving across state lines to an approved livestock facility. Many of um, our LMA members, your livestock markets, would be an approved livestock facility. They have the ability to receive cattle across state lines from a customer out of state that does not have an ICVI or health certificate if that cattle those cattle are moved on an owner shipper statement and then a health certificate would then be written once they are received at that approved facility. So what is an owner shipper statement? Um, it's pretty clearly defined within the regulation um, certain things that need to be listed including uh, the name and address of the owner, where the cattle are moving from and where they're being received. Um, however, there's no set form that is needed to be used to be an ownership or statement. So in some cases, we see states using an existing document, for example, a tag-in slip at a market, as their ownership or statement document. As we talk about ADT, I think one thing that's important to keep in the background and remember is that other state requirements are going to continue to apply. You know, states have for a long time set their own identification, documentation, disease-specific requirements, and because of that, um, those requirements continue to apply um, regardless of ADT. So in order to move cattle between states, uh, you need to comply both with animal disease traceability as well as any state import requirements. One um, example of this that's gotten a lot of discussion is uh, dairy steers. I mentioned earlier that while dairy steers born after March 2013 do need to be officially identified, those official IDs do not need to be listed on the health certificate. That's what ADT lays out. However, certain states do require that those official IDs be listed on the health certificate in order to import dairy steers into those states. Um, so in those cases, um, producers or markets are having to go ahead and read those official IDs and have them listed not to comply with ADT but to comply with that import state requirement. In January of this year, USDA um, outlined what they called traceability performance standards, some standards that they were going to use to uh, go to these, go to our states and see um, how well ADT is being uh, complied with or how what how good of a job we're doing in order to get some baseline information and there were four different activities that the USDA is going to be gathering information on that first activity is just that the receiving state um, receives the animal that was officially identified and notifies the state of the official identification number Second is going to be the shipping state, and that shipping state is going to validate that the official ID was issued and applied, and using their records, who was that official ID. So there's four performance standards. Um, the first is the receiving state uh, confirming that 
that animal was received with official ID. Second performance standard is that the shipping state uh, validates that that official ID was applied there and um, their records in terms of who that ID was distributed to. Third and fourth performance standard, uh, third is going to be that that receiving state informs the shipping state of the animal being received. And that shipping state could be the state where the animal was identified or it could be a different state if there has been movement in between um, that identifying state and receiving state. So making sure that the receiving state notifies the shipping state that the animal was received. Final uh, performance measure that USDA laid out is that that shipping state validates the movement of the animal from the shipping state to the receiving state using ICVIs or other documentation. Um, we had Dr. Weimers at the U.S. Animal Health Association a annual meeting just last week talking about some of these performance standards saying that some of the baseline data has been um, being collected. Um, he said that I uh, framed it as lots of room for improvement in terms of what some of those early numbers were showing. He said that it looks like there's going to be um, a c ability for these states or industry as a whole to really improve some of these performance standard numbers as we get further into the implementation of ADT. March 4th of this year, um, USDA did send out a bulletin announcing that they were entering into the next phase of ADT implementation. For that first about year, it really was an education phase, and this announcement in March of this year indicated that the next phase that we're moving into is an enforcement phase. That doesn't mean that USDA intends to have a heavy-handed approach. Um, in fact, I think that that is the opposite of their intention. But um, they are going to pursue penalties in situations where an individual is repeatedly failing to comply with ADT requirements despite receiving education and receiving opportunities to come into compliance. In terms of what are USDA's enforcement priorities, they've outlined three priorities. First, that the cattle that are required to be officially identified are in fact identified. Second, that our ICVIs or health certificates are properly administered. And third, that that collection of ID is uh, happening at slaughter at the packing houses. USDA is going to address these uh, ADT compliance with their existing staff and cases would begin with an AVIC or an area vet in charge, investigating a case, cre creating documentation, and then uh, providing that to USDA's investigative enforcement services moving forward. In March of this year, there was a monitoring and compliance document that was updated. That's a document we've seen a couple updates to. Um, some of the highlights from that document um, include the that states will lead educational efforts. Um, part of that is because states are making some of these individual decisions and therefore it um, really needs to come from a state level to explain what is required in terms of will brands be accepted as official IDs and things like that. Federal and state officials um, are taking a lead in distributing official identification devices and it was hit pretty hard in that document. It's also the requirement of those individuals that are distributing those devices to keep records to determine where an animal was first officially identified. Um, document went into detail on ICVIs, the need for them to be completed by an accredited veterinarian to include the required information and to be sent to both the shipping and receiving states as is required. Document also outlined some field functions and some activities to provide a little bit more clarity in terms of what enforcement will like, look like going forward. In terms of the responsible parties, um, it is pretty broad in terms of who is responsible. Uh, no person may move covered livestock or receive such livestock moved interstate. We've talked to USDA and it's their intent that this is written broad on purpose. Certainly the owner that moves livestock across state lines without complying is going to fall underneath this definition. However, there's a chance in some cases that others will be responsible as well that um, were a part of that movement and that is USDA's intent. 
So moving forward, um, consistency and enforcement is going to be key, and that's something we're going to need to see what that looks like going forward. We're starting to hear about some investigations on some of our first cases now. Um, have quite a few letters of information that have been sent out, but in terms of actual case numbers, we're pretty low at this point. Um, one question that I have moving forward and will be interested to see is how will enforcement of ADT uh, be consistently enforced against all regulated entities regardless of method of sale. We realize as livestock markets, lots of cattle move hands through our markets and will certainly be a place that state and federal officials are looking to make sure the requirements are being adhered to, however they apply to all cattle 18 months of age or older, regardless of how they're sold. And because of that, um, we're going to want to see um, consistent enforcement in the country as well. There's also um, some questions still on the state side in terms of what will the role of the state be when it comes to enforcement. And I think we'll learn a little bit more and see a little bit more there moving forward. Last piece I just wanted to touch on is um, a need from my perspective, and I think the perspective of many, um, for a resource that is easily accessible to figure out what all is required in ADT, but then also state requirements, import requirements, moving cattle from one state to another. Um, often you have this question, and the answer might be, call the state veterinarian's office. You don't always have easy access there, and there's kind of some user interpretation error where you don't always get the correct answer either. So uh, the United States Animal Health Association and the National Institute of Animal Agriculture um, both have policy and are pursuing a creation of some sort of a resource along with industry and animal health officials that would fill this need. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Kaylin to uh, present some of the Global Vet Link information. I believe at the end of her presentation, there will be an opportunity for both of us to answer some questions. That's exactly right, Chelsea. Great job. Fast overview, a wealth of information. Thank you for putting that together. While we transition from Chelsea to Kaylin, I want to mention the question and answers. We did have that rolling on the slides prior to the start of our symposium, but at any time, Feel free to send in questions using the GoToWebinar chat window. Chelsea and Kaylin will address those questions in question and answer time after the presentation. So lots of time to get to that. Uh, if you see that panel on the right side of your screen, there's a chat button and feel free to feel free to just put your question in there and we'll distribute it as necessary. And and with that, it's Kaylin Henry of Global Vet Link. Kaylin? Thanks, Ned, and thank you, Chelsea. What a great overview of ADT. We really do appreciate your your time and, and your expertise on that topic today. So I'm going to go ahead and um, give you a little bit of an overview on some technology that we're working on here at Global VetLink. All right, so um, a little bit about Global VetLink. We were founded in 1999 by Kevin Maher. Uh, Kevin worked in the swine genetics industry. Um, there he realized that there had to be a better way to deal with regulatory paperwork. Um, any veterinarian that's on the call today knows that, you know, the traditional method of, of health certificates or ICVIs, which Chelsea mentioned as a, a main point of the ADT compliance, um, is done with paper and four-part carbon forms that you have to mail in. Um, Kevin's vision was to replace this archaic paper-based system with a digital solution. Um, and that he did. As I say, since you know around the year 2000, 2001, we've been bringing states on to use our digital health certificate or ECVI system. And um, now we've been able to add a brand new feature. It's something we've been working toward really since the inception of our eCVIs. Um, we wanted to make those CVIs smart, and hence the GVL smart engine name. Um, this is something that we've been asked for for years when we go to veterinary conferences. Are your digital certificates going to tell me everything that has to be on them to comply with interstate movement requirements? Um, up until now, we've had to say no. Um, but this new technology, the smart engine technology, is going to uh, allow us to be able to answer that with a yes from here on out. Um, this really, it, it's, it's 
become a relevant topic in the issue or in the industry uh, because of the implementation of ADT um, and just the general demand for digital technology and an easy to access animal movement requirement system. Uh, the veterinarians coming out of school today are young, you know, everyone wants technology, be it our veterinarians, our producers, um, that's, that's the way the world is, is headed. So we hope that we can help fill that void. Um, so moving on to talk a little bit more in depth about the smart engine technology. This is an enhancement to our HealthLink system. Um, HealthLink is our name for our digital animal health certification or our ECVI system. It's a two-part enhancement. Part one is providing that one-stop shop for looking up state import requirements and part two is building that auto verification right into the digital CVI process and you know this really is going to help improve the efficiency of animal movement and disease containment overall. We feel that there are benefits to this GVL smart engine system. Um, first of all, to our veterinary customers, providing that single online destination to look up interstate animal movement requirements, improving the accuracy of the certificates of veterinary inspection, um, and the efficiency, especially in fast-paced environments such as auction markets, um, a lot of times cattle are moved on the weekends, um, when you just can't call up a state animal health official's office and ask for import requirements. Um, our online system can help you know, get over that hurdle, find it really quickly and easily online. The training required for assistance, veterinary assistance and technicians when creating CVIs is another pain point that we've often heard in the industry. So giving one resource where they can go in and uh, just look those up and, and not having to know all those requirements off the top of their head and not having to, you know, fumble through a lot of different websites as every state seems to, you know, their format is different and getting people on the phone, as well just simplifying the compliance of the new ADT rule. Veterinarians are only one of our customers. Um, the state animal health officials are another very important customer to us, and um, we wanted this system to help them as well. So our intent is that this would help reduce the number of incoming phone calls for import requirements to the state offices eliminating the need for states to keep up their own online requirements web page, if they choose, of course, and improving the efficiency of reviewing those documents once they get them in, because we can build features into their online system that they have with us to help them review those documents and ensure accuracy. Whenever we make documents more accurate from the beginning, that's obviously going to reduce time spent following up on compliance issues. So with that, I will um, just pause here briefly and I'm going to pull up the actual uh, system itself. We want to show you what we have. Um, it is in a beta release right now, so we actually have things live that we can show you. You should see um, the web page that we've set up for our movement requirements powered by GVL Smart Engine. The intent of this web page is for our customers to be able to come and put in the specifics of a load of cattle or you know whatever whatever that may be, load of cattle, load of horses, load of pigs, come in and put those specifics in here and find out what the import requirements are. So I'm going to just set an example here. Um, this is all still, you know, test information that's in here. So don't worry a lot about the actual data that you see, but more the concept behind, um, behind what we're doing here. So we're moving from Iowa into Montana. The one thing Chelsea mentioned in her presentation was that there are approved tagging sites that you can move animals into without that official identification where they can then place the identification on them. Um, we've built in a feature so that each um, state can list out their approved tagging sites so that a user would know where it's acceptable to take those animals unidentified. 
we'll put in a little bit more information here. Um, I'm going to use bovine as my example, um, but we have collected uh, requirements on various species. So when this goes out, it, it won't just be bovine. Um, we've got equine requirements in here. Um, you'll see a list of different species that we're working on. So I'm just filling in the rest of the information. I'm going to hit find requirements. What you'll see pop up on your screen is the list of requirements for moving this load of cattle. It's broken out into ADT requirements and state requirements. Um, you'll see if we click on the CVI, it gives a brief explanation of what a CVI is. Um, same with the entry permit. If there are any notes or um, potential exceptions that go along with each requirement, those are noted here and we can click and expand and then read what those notes or exceptions are. So that's piece one when I talked about that value proposition for veterinarians. Um, piece two is the piece where we built it into our CVI process and so I just have to flip screens here if you just bear with me. We will get logged in as a veterinarian. So this may be new for some of you out there. Um, what you're going to see is what our veterinary uh, clients see when they log into our system. I'm going to pick Health Link on our left-hand menu, which is our CVI system. And um, we see a screen here where we enter in all of that certificate information. I've already started one, so I didn't have to bore you with watching me enter data. So I'm just going to load it up here. Um, I've entered a bovine group. We've got um, males, 30 months of age for breeding. And then along the top, we have a button for verify. And what that does is bring up a screen that looks really similar to that one pager where we looked up the requirements before. So it would break it into your ADT rules and your state rules. Um, it would indicate if um, you've met this requirement or not with the X or the check mark. And then it'll actually tell you if you had more than one animal or more than one group, um, which animal or group is not compliant if there was, um, you know, maybe just one of multiple groups that wasn't, and it will tell you, you know, what that requirement is if you drop that down. So as I say, that's, that's part two of our solution for our veterinarians. Now, I do believe that we have um, several state animal health officials on the call today as well. So I was going to briefly show you um, in our state veterinarian login what, a, um, what that looks like, a few of the tools. I'm not going to go in depth because there are a lot of tools on the state veterinarian side that are a little bit more around the administration of these rules to help us validate them. Um, what we did was we had um, actually a really great uh, vet student intern work with us all summer to help gather all of the requirements. Uh, we wanted to make this um, the least put the least amount of burden on our state animal health officials as possible. So we went and gathered as many of those requirements as we could. And what we've done is enter them and and given our state vets tools to verify and validate those rules. So I won't get into all of all of that detail, but just a few of the highlights as far as what a state veterinarian can do here. Um, the one thing that we're going to make sure is really easy for them to do is to also see what requirements have been met or not met on a certificate by certificate basis. Um, we think that's really important to help speed up their process and help, you know, maybe it's 4.30 on a Friday afternoon and, and they haven't been able to check all of the certificates from Global Vet Link that were done that day, but what they could do is come in really quick and check the ones that um, did not meet all requirements. So, you know, we really want to try to help make their lives easier in addition to our practicing veterinarians' lives easier as well. And from here, you know, they can also look up, go to our, 
our rule lookup as well and, and use that tool. So um, really exciting time for us with having this in a beta release. Um, that beta release means that we do have the tools in the state veterinarian's hands. Um, that's where we want to start. They are the ones that you know we have to work with to get all of those rules in there correctly and validated. Um, and then once we do that, that's when our veterinary clients will be able to use both the lookup page and the certificate validation. Um, so we're working through that process right now with our state partners. Um, we've had really great response so far and, and we hope to uh, you know, be able to push this out to the veterinarians soon as well. So um, with that, I will throw it back to Ned and um, we can go from there. Nice job, Kayla. Great overview. Appreciate your information. I appreciate the, uh, the uh, show that you gave us regarding your software and can see that it would be very valuable to anyone in the livestock industry that is involved with moving livestock from certainly one state to another or really within the state. Good stuff. Um, Chelsea, we do have a, our first question from the audience. And again, just a reminder, audience, if you would, use the chat window to the right of your screen and uh, type your questions in there. Uh, Chelsea, the first one today is about tribes and guidelines. Can tribes set stricter guidelines? You know, that's an interesting question and I, I'm not positive the answer to it. Um, they, tribes are used like state or addressed like state veterinarians are in terms of their ability to make decisions within the rule. I'll be honest, I'm not sure the answer in terms of um, can tribes have a, well, any, any state can have stricter guidelines. Um, so, for example, I, I gave the example of the dairy steers and their import requirements in some states being stricter than ADT. Stricter guidelines, certainly. Um, I do know that states cannot opt out of ADT, and I don't believe tribes can either, but I need to... Um, admit that I'm not positive if tribes can have less strict guidelines. I just do know that do know that they can have stricter guidelines. Hopefully that makes sense. Great. Thank you for the, the clarification you were able to give us. We have a question uh, again on clarification from the audience. For clarification, standard four is to get the shipping state to determine the premises the animal was actually shipped from. So for clarification standard four, get the shipping state to determine the premises the animal was actually shipped from. The, um, the shipping, the, it's my understanding that, for so example, the, the state or tribe that receives notification that an animal moved interstate from its jurisdiction determines the address or location from which the reference animal was shipped. So correct, that the shipping state determines the location that animal was shipped from. Okay, very good. Let's go to the next question from the audience. For producers wishing to sell truckload lots of mature call cows to an out-of-state slaughter facility, where would logical places be for those cows to be backtagged? As I understand it, those animals cannot move directly from the farm to the harvest plant without an official back tag placed on each individual cow. So what document would record and follow that back tag, and what would be the logical place for the cow to be back tagged? So in terms of what the rule requires, that it's correct that if those ca if those cattle are moving interstate but they're moving directly to a slaughter facility, they may be back tagged. In terms of um, the question on back tag placement, um, I think that I'm perceiving that to be a literal question and my answer would be, the hope would be the back tag would be placed in an area that there is um, good retention, that the back tags are not lost. So. That that's my answer to back tag placement, that it needs to be placed in an area that you have good retention. Is there a, um, a, a point in the shipping process that the back tag would most logically be placed where at the point oh. that it would be applied? Oh, okay. At, at what time would it be applied? That makes sense. Um, it is my understanding that it is supposed to be applied prior to moving interstate unless it is being 
moved interstate directly to a tagging site approved livestock facility, in which case it could be applied there and then moved directly to slaughter. So either prior to moving interstate, if it's going directly to slaughter, would be, I think, the, um, the most common model or the, the model that I hear talked about the most. Um, I hope that that's responding to the question. Yeah, that's great. Great information, Chelsea. I'm going to go to Kaylin with the next question from our audience. Will GVL be legally responsible for providing each state's import requirements, or will the information be similar to that available on the USDA APHIS website? So the question really has to do with how detailed the information will be, and will it be specific state by state? Great question. It is our goal to make the information as detailed and as complete as possible. Um, however, we obviously, um, you know, we have to make sure we do things um, to cover ourselves for liability purposes. Um, we will have agreements in state with each state before th this is released to veterinarians. Um, we also have different ways for um, for users to know when the last time that the requirements were updated for each state. So um, there's uh, already built into the system going to be an automatic email go out um, periodically to ask all of our state users to go in and update the valid as of date so that that always appears when that screen pops up to show you the requirements. You know, so it would say the state of Iowa validated on October 1st. Um, so we have some things in place for that. That has been, you know, one of our concerns that that we've heard when talking to our customers is knowing how current that information is. Great. Good insight. I appreciate that response. So here's a very specific question. Um, a gentleman is in the Rangeland, is the Rangeland program manager at the Pueblo of Laguna. And his rangeland code requires that all livestock being imported into the reservation be accompanied with a CVI. Will he, and how will he, be able to access your system, Caitlin? So, um, if he's talking just the lookup page, um, uh, that will be behind our login in the initial um, in the initial release, so it will be available to any of our our, our clients, um, and it is all online right now. Um, it's it will be an online um, tool at the moment. Very good. Next question: If states do not keep their web pages up to date, and GVL is the only place to get the information, does that the question continues with, how is that a good thing? And I guess I would uh, rephrase that to say, does that limit access to the information for general uses by those who don't directly use GVL? Now, as I continue with this, the USDA APHIS website has links to all the states that take you straight to the information. There is a concern about GVL being the only place to find the up-to-date information. So any thoughts on that? Caitlin? Yes. You know, I think for us, um, that that's a long-term vision for us. Sure, we would love to be able to be the place to go to take that off of the states, you know, off their plates. We know that, you know, there's less and less time, less and less resources all the time, and if we could be that place, if we had some kind of, um, you know, some kind of a working agreement with that, you know, obviously that's probably not the the near term, but as I say, it's one of those things that we would love to be able to help out with, um, and um, you know I think that's just where we are going with that. And you know, kind of when I was presenting it, even said if they choose, you know, if they choose that to be the case. So um, I still I still see the states keeping up their websites as well, um, but you know you never know where this could progress to. Good information, and it's kind of an open-ended question. It's very difficult to foretell the future. Um, okay, next question from the audience. Through Global Vet Link, this is very specific, are you able to put more than one species on a single eCVI? 
we encourage one species the way our CVIs are set up. Um, that came from you know, we designed it that way after polling the state veterinary offices how they, you know, how they wanted to see them. So um, the one species is how it's it is set up right now. Very good, very good, and um, uh, an easy one. <laughs> When's the lookup and validation expected to be available to veterinarians? I would love to see it available to veterinarians uh, by the end of the year. What we'll do is we will turn it on state by state as those agreements, you know, we have, um, we work with each state and we want to make sure that our our contracts and everything are in place and they have rules validated, um, but we'll turn those on as we get them so it doesn't have to be an all or nothing kind of a thing. Sure. Sure. A lot of a lot of questions about the interaction of GBL and not only the access but also the technology. Here's one from the audience. When entering individual animal ID, is there a way to collect RFID 840 tags and use that technology? And how does that work in coordination with GBL system? We don't currently have a hardware interface. Um, we have what we call our ID wizard built into our CVI system. Um, it's an easy copy and paste from a spreadsheet, um, which a lot of those RFID readers will dump information into a spreadsheet. Um, so right now, we don't have any kind of hardware integration for the reader. Understood. iPads. Who's without them? The question is, will we be able to use an iPad to create or access, uh, create eDocs or access information in the GBL system? Yes, you can use an iPad. Currently, you can use an iPad um, as long as you have internet access. Very good. Question from the audience, how often are the state requirements updated? And that's something that um, certainly we, we would like to hear from Kaylin about how often within her system those are updated, but also I guess the question would go back to Chelsea, how how big a turnover do you see in those? So Kaylin, if you would first, how is it updated in your system? Sure. Um, as I say, we're kind of working on that first pass right now to get all of them in initially. Um, and then the understanding with the states will be, you know, as soon as they have something that changes that we want them to let us know, um, it's going to be a priority for us to update those in our system. And then I'll have those monthly reminders going out just to ensure that everything is up to date and for them to go in and update that, um, you know, valid as of or current as of date to show on the system. Surely, surely. Good. And then Chelsea, how, uh, from your experience, is, is that a annual or <laughs> what kind of a turnover process is there in that, in that information? It it, it varies greatly, and it honestly varies by states in terms of how much flexibility they have within their um, legal structure. For some states, they have to make a regulation or even a statute change to change their movement requirements. That's a slow, tedious process. It doesn't happen very often. Other states have some flexibility where they can um, make uh, changes pretty quickly um, if we see a new disease pop up or have something where they want to have a uh, movement restriction that's like an alert or a temporary movement restriction. We'll see those more and more often. Um, the other thing is, is within ADT, states do have the ability to reach agreements with other states. So we um, could see more states starting to, for example, enter into agreements will, where they would accept an alternative movement document rather than an ICVI. That's a pretty fluid process that um, could see you know, multiple updates a year in that way. So it really does vary. Okay, so the question is, thank you, Chelsea, nice job. Question from the audience, can you upload an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV, comma, separated value form, so the individual official ID can be searched on? Kaylin? All right. Um, as I mentioned, the feature that we currently has is a copy and paste um, from the spreadsheet. Um, our old system actually had an upload, and it, it seemed a little bit 
complicated sometimes. Um, so we've got a really easy copy and paste for right now from a spreadsheet. And then that does go into our database. So in turn, that makes those IDs searchable. So um, when the state veterinarians, um, if there is a, a trace out situation and they're looking for CVIs with a specific ID, they can go to their login that I briefly showed you, type in an ID and, um, and, and find any certificate that has that that ID on it. Great, thank you. Chelsea, a question on official tags. Besides official metal tags, are there certain electronic ear tags that are currently approved for interstate movement? I, I believe that there are, that USDA has worked with a couple of different providers for that. Um, the only thing to be aware of is that there will be a change as of March 11th of 2015. Um, Prior to that, um, you are going to have your individual company tags that would be counting as official ID. Following March 11, 2015, all official tags are going to have to bear the official ear tag shield, and that uh, goes through USDA, but USDA is working with some providers to have those electronic tags um, available as official ID in addition to the metal news tags. There we go. Uh, great information again, Chelsea. Kaylin, a uh, question from the audience. The GVL smart system, how does it work with the state's ECVI and ICVI? We have these electronic CDs in 22 plus states, so how do those interact with the smart system? Um, the Our smart system just works with our CVIs, um, so with the CVIs that Global Vet Link offers. So there is no interaction at this time with the state with the state run systems. Understood. So here's another question related to the state and the state run systems. How can you ensure every state has up to date movement requirements? Until this is ensured, as a veterinarian, the questioner notes, I'm responsible for contacting them directly. So what what process is in place to make sure that it's an official knowledge so that the veterinarians and others who need this information can rely on that rather than having to go back to the states? Great question. As I mentioned, um, all of the rules that we're putting in have to be validated by the state animal health official before they're actually used in our system. So um, no rule will be used in the system until it's validated. And um, every rule actually, it has a validate button on it. it the states can either validate it or send us feedback if we need to you know, adjust it, correct it, edit it, delete it. Um, so they're, you know, no rule will be used unless it's validated by the state. Understood. Great. And by the way, we've got about another four or five minutes left in this presentation. And as we mentioned before, you will receive links to the video of the presentation if there are others in your organization that you need to share it with. So here's a really good question for technology people trying to figure out, will I have internet access? And if I don't at this location, how will I be able to use the system? So can I work with this offline or do I have to be online with internet access to utilize this? And are there any bandwidth requirements? Great question. Currently, our system is entirely online, um, but we have been researching um, the the demand for offline products as well. So um, that's something that as a as a product management team we're exploring as well. So not yet, but sometime soon. Can a shipping permit number be issued through Global Vet Link electronically if needed, or does the vet still have to contact the state of destination to get that, Caitlin? Uh, you will still have to contact the state of destination for the uh, permit number. Very good. And we touched on that one. What is the cost? Oh, here we go. What is the cost for a veterinarian that is writing five to forty CVIs a month? And uh, that that would be the question. So, we, can you give us some idea for, in this case, a veterinarian writing less than fifty a month? What kind of cost they might come to 
Sure, that's a great question. Um, really, the best thing to do is to call our territory managers on that. Um, uh, as product managers, they don't they don't let us price things. Um, we uh, we leave that up to our territory managers because it does. It depends on size of clinic. It depends on certificates, how many vets, and so on. So, best thing is to definitely talk to one of our managers. Understood. Kaylin, uh, this question we, we touched on briefly, but uh, kind of from the other side of it, the, the question from the listener is, is GVL the sole vendor for a web-based animal health import requirement system, and is it funded by the USDA? Are you the only place, the only system of its kind? I'm the only, or we're the only system that I know of. Um, currently that is trying to implement this this type of a thing. Um, we are not funded by the USDA. We're a private, we're a private company. Um, so as I say, as far as I know, to my knowledge, we're the only one um, taking this, this initiative at this time. Understood. So as we finish out today, looking for a uh, last question or two for that uh, sole source time frame. Um, time frame. What's the time frame that this new feature is going to be available, Caitlin, to veterinarians? As I say, we're, we're working through getting all of those requirements in with the state animal health officials right now. I would love to see some states turned on by the end of the year. That's one of my big goals. Um, but as I say, it'll be highly dependent on you know how, how quickly and seamlessly we can work through getting all of those requirements in um, accurately and, and getting those validated with our state partners. Great information. Great information. Kaylin, Kaylin Henry, appreciate you uh, filling us in on the global vet link side of the equation. And Chelsea Good, Vice President of Government and Industry Affairs with the Livestock Marketing Association, thank you as well for the wealth of information you shared with us today. This webinar is accredited for one hour of race certified continuing education. The CE credit will be awarded to registered attendees that attend no less than 45 minutes of the 60 minute session. If more than one person attends the webinar under a single login, all present attendees must complete the electronic sign-in sheet available at globalvetlink.com slash simplifying hyphen regulation hyphen nation. And the recorded version of the webinar will be available for CE credit. Each individual that wants to obtain CE credit must submit a passing post-test, which will also be available at the globalvetlink.com website. Follow-up survey, Global Vet Link will send the attendees a survey after this webinar is over to learn more about feedback on the webinar and to obtain information to apply CE credit. The webinar is being recorded, will be available at globalvetlink.com within seven business days after the webinar. And for more information, call Global Vet Link at 515-817-5704 or check out the webpage at globalvetlink at globalvetlink.com. Thanks again for attending this webinar on Simplifying Regulation Nation, Animal Disease Traceability, and Interstate Movement Requirements Made Easy, brought to you by Global Vet Link. For Truffle Media Networks, I'm Ned Arthur.